opportunity for me to join you here today. And what I would like to do is just to share a few ideas, but I'm keen to answer your questions as well. So if you have questions at any point along the time, along the line, don't hesitate to raise your hand. Uh, even if you really want me to slow down, speak more clearly, I'm happy to do that. Yes, I head up uh, a research group in Accenture. It's called the Institute for High Performance. It is a team that is approximately 32 people spread around the United States, the UK, India, China, and Brazil. And our responsibility is to do research on topics that are just over the horizon. So three to five years away from today. Because our goal is to try and understand what changes are occurring in the global economy, in technology, in business practices that could affect my company, Accenture, but also that could affect Accenture's clients. The area that I do most of my research and consulting in is around leadership. I've always been deeply interested uh, in how people, how men and women, learn to lead. Today I'll share with you some of those ideas, but I'll, I'll emphasize one very important thing. Uh, I'm not trying to understand what leaders should do. I'm trying to understand how people, men and women, learn to lead. So it's less the what and more the how. And I think that's an important topic these days because one of the questions that we are facing is where will the next generation or two of leaders come from? Will people want to be leaders in business in the future? And if they do, how can we help them become leaders faster than ever before? I think the demand is huge and it's going to be growing. So today, let me just take a few minutes to 
talk about uh, a phenomenon that we're finding in business that I suspect you've already noticed. <clears throat> that to become a high-performing business is a very difficult thing. But it's even more difficult to stay a high-performer. That if you look at the, the average lifespan of companies that have been uh, top performers, it's getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Part of the reason for that is that competition is emerging from different places. Business models that are truly competitive are emerging from a wide variety of places around the globe. And therefore, the idea that you could remain a high-performing business, a dominant business, simply because of a core technology is no longer a sustainable idea. That technology and competitive approaches are changing rapidly. So even if a company may think it's a high performer, and 65% of the companies that we've interviewed, surveyed, think that they're high performers, less than 25%, more like 20%, actually are the high performers in their industry. Sort of like the phenomena that one finds in, in families. Everyone thinks their child is beautiful. Yeah. The dilemma, of course, is that they are beautiful and not so beautiful children. And no one wants to tell someone else that their child is ugly. Now, that said, uh, the reality is that the fortunes of companies can change very rapidly. And I think you've seen that occurring around the world. That's why one of the things that we've been very interested in uh, is what enables a company to become a high-performing company and what enables it to remain a high-performer. The institute that I lead, called the Institute for High Performance, uh, is built around research on companies that not only outperform their peers, but outperform their peers over changes in technology, over changes in leadership and changes in business conditions or business cycles. And what we've discovered is that the truly high performing companies are ones that are able to move from one product or service to another in a timely way. And what I mean by that is to say that you're all familiar with the idea of an S curve, whether it's in a product or a technology. Those who get started early usually get a benefit of being able to uh, receive disproportionate profits because they've entered a market with the right idea at the right time. But if they are successful, lots of others will come into the market as well. Uh, and as others come into the market, the benefits associated with being in a given technology or a product begin to erode, be diminished. And eventually, the, the industry will plateau. So you have a, an S-curve. Well, what's interesting is that high-performing companies are able to work across multiple S-curves. They don't get stuck on one and then wither and die. They are able to move across them. So the question we asked is, is why are some companies able to move from one winning product or service to another, while others get stuck. Well, this research that we've been doing has, over the course of the last 15 years, folks have lost, uh, focused a lot of attention on what leaders and talent in organization add to high performance. So I'm going to suggest to you that one of the things that we've come to discover is that it's not just having new technology that matters. It's having the right talent, the right leaders, and the right capabilities that makes a huge difference in the organization's ability to remain a high performer. So among the, the, the research that we've done has been work on analytics, the use of analytical tools uh, to increase the quality of decision making, uh, on human capital strategy, particularly the decisions about what kinds of skills to invest in and when on leadership development, but particularly on how to grow more leaders faster, uh, 
and then ultimately on organizational networks, particularly the network um, of the networks that give rise to innovation, uh, to talent retention, to the creation of new ideas. So what we've discovered over the course of the past oh, seven or eight years is that talent matters, leadership matters in ways that many people never realized. We've always known that it's important to have leaders in your organization, but what we've discovered is that the leaders that really add the most are learning adaptable leaders. Not just people who have a style that they use over and over again, but leaders who are capable of, of adapting to changing times. So one of the things that I'm going to be encouraging you to be thinking about is what are you doing to keep yourself alive, learning, eyebrows raised in surprise, because those are the qualities that will make you an effective leader throughout the course of your career. What I want to do is to, is to share with you right now just a, a brief video that comes from work that we've been doing with Unilever. And Unilever, you know, is a, is a global products company, fast-moving consumer goods company, probably best known for its Dove's, Dove soap and Life Boy soap and a variety of other um, personal care products. Well, Unilever began about 18 months ago to, to ask itself, what kind of leaders do we need for the year 2020? Unilever has set for itself a very ambitious agenda of growth. It wants to double its revenue between now and 2020. It wants to become an 80 billion euro company uh, in that period of time. It wants to reduce by half uh, its carbon emissions. Uh, and it wants to dramatically increase its contributions to the social betterment of women and children, particularly in rural uh, economies. So in order to do that, they had to go back and rethink, well, will our old model of leaders get us to 2020? And if not, then what do we need in the way of new leadership skills or competencies going forward? So this video captures some of their thinking. Uh, it captures some of the best ideas of business school faculty and deans from some of the most prestigious business schools around the world. And it culminates in five attributes that Unilever thinks are going to be essential for it as a company in the future. Uh, I would be curious as to whether or not these five attributes apply to, to your organization as well. So, so Neil, why don't you just play that video and then we can talk a bit about it. The authenticity is the underlying, the wellspring from which everything flows. So knowing who you are, having a clear purpose. I truly believe from purpose to impact is the real challenge now. Future leaders in business in general will need to be highly resilient because we live in a world in which failure is more common and, and it's faster, things fail faster. So we need to be able to see that and adjust to it. Ask you to have a deep sense of cultural curiosity and empathy for people in whatever market you're in, uh, and not try to impose your dominant paradigm from your home market or the corporation's home market on other people, which has been the traditional method of globalization. And of course, we, we need leaders who have a systemic perspective because. More and more, the separation that we used to have between business and society in Dublin uh, are barriers that are breaking down. People expect leaders who are capable of thinking across these boundaries. They have to be able to see how the decisions that they make could have an impact on the society. you here, won't even keep you here. And that, that's the reality. You must collaborate with uh, suppliers, with customers, with competitors, 
with other industry parties to come up with solutions that are too complicated for any single organization or any single leader to tackle on their own. I think in this 21st century what we need to do is essentially abandon uh, a lot of the assumptions that we were making as to how the world works. <coughs> Obviously, are words, ideas that are very relevant to this company, Unilever, at this point in its history. So I'm not suggesting that they apply universally. But I'm curious, as you watch that video, as you heard people talking, as you looked at the model that they've created with purpose at the center, surrounded by authenticity, adaptability, resilience, systemic thinking, Results orientation. Does any of that apply beyond? Does that apply here? Yes. Is there anything there that, that really stood out to you as being especially relevant? Thanks to the, the terms of adaptability itself. Adaptability. Because uh, the alliance itself uh, has faced with uh, a quick, a dramatic change around our environment. Uh, so one thing is that. Uh, see about uh, the regulation has changed so fast and also uh, the customer itself wants more than before yes. and also uh, yes as you see that uh, the technology itself was already pretty around here and that we must stick together and still <coughs> give the, our customers to be satisfied. Very good. You know, this, this notion of adaptability is, is hugely <coughs> The ability to learn, to learn faster than your competitors and especially for leaders to learn. It's a challenge in many ways because in traditional organizations, you climb the ranks of leadership and become increasingly convinced that you know everything. And that's exactly the wrong conclusion. Because the reality is that your responsibility increases to know more. To be open to learning new things. One of the things that I try to encourage senior executives to be worried about is how can they bring the future into the room? How can they bring the future into their decision making? Recognizing, as the business school professors said, the future is going to be volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, and yet you have to try and anticipate what the future is going to bring and make it part of your lifestyle. And the people who have the greatest responsibility for that are a company's leaders. Which means in some ways the boardroom has to be like stepping into the future. But the future is not just technology. It's new markets, new kinds of customers, new kinds of employees. So that one of the companies that I've had the, the honor of working with, the, the Tata Group, the Tata Sons in India, Tata Chemicals in particular, which is a remarkably interesting company, one of the things they've said is we need to bring new countries into the world as quickly as possible. Not simply explore them, but if we establish a business in the United States, or if we establish a business in Mali, we need to bring those people into our conversations as quickly as possible because they are the future. <coughs> the 
And one of the things that I have found fascinating working with companies like Unilever, the Tata Group, Mercedes-Benz, Pacific Gas and Electric, the FBI in, in the United States, currently with the World Food Program as well, is that people are convinced that adaptability, the ability to learn quickly, is going to be a success factor in the future. Which is one of the reasons why I'm delighted to be here, because here you have an institution that's dedicated to learning. But I think one of the things I would challenge you always to be thinking is that learning is not an easy thing to do. For many of us, the most difficult thing about education was getting up in the morning, in the morning, having breakfast and going off to school. That was the difficult thing. But as you've grown older, what you've come to recognize is that true learning requires you to set aside things that you know well and try new things that you've never conceived of. It's not just adding a little bit more information. It is quite literally trying on an entirely different set of clothes. The older you get, when you get to be my age, sometimes you question whether it's necessary to learn new things. But if your organization is going to continue to survive, it's going to continue to prosper, it has to stay young. <laughs> I wouldn't agree more. <laughs> and that means that even if you're 65 years old or 60 years old, you still have to want to learn. So in many ways, the programs that we've been trying to help our clients develop have been focused on making older people young again. <laughs> now, what I'd like to do is, is to share some ideas about how we've been trying to do that. As I said at the outset, I'm, I'm not going to focus a lot of energy about what leaders need to be. What I instead I want to focus attention on is how leaders need to learn. But not what they have to learn, but how they learn. And an issue that has always been of great interest to me uh, has been the question of how do men and women learn to lead? If the, even if you start from the idea that some people are born to be leaders and other people are not, even if you believe that, one thing is clear. One thing is clear. Even the most natural leaders, even that three-year-old child that all the other children follow around, even the most gifted leaders have to learn new things. They're not going to be ready for everything that they're going to encounter in this world. So even the most naturally talented have to learn. So again, the question is, how do they learn? Well, the the research that we've done has led us to identify five attributes, aspects of learning to lead, uh, each one of which I've given a, a capital C to, so we call them the five C's. We start with crucibles. I wrote a book a few years back after having done some work with my colleague Warren Bennis uh, from the University of Southern California. Uh, I wrote a book called Crucibles of Leadership. Now, this isn't a steel company, but my guess is you know what a crucible is. What is a crucible? It's, it, yeah, but, but in, in, in steel making, in metallurgy, in chemistry, what is a crucible? Yeah, it's, it's something that you... Molding, then it's something that you pour liquid metal into. So a crucible is something that is remarkably strong, remarkably durable, but it holds something very precious. So we use the idea of a crucible to say that there are times in people's lives when they learn important lessons about leadership, lessons that stick with them for the rest of their lives. And what was interesting to me is I, I began doing research with accomplished leaders. 
of all ages, in business, in government, in religious organizations, in sporting organizations. And I ask a very simple question. It's a question I would encourage you to, to ask yourselves. I would ask, can you tell me about a time in your life when you learned something important about yourself as a leader? Not about leadership in general, but about yourself as a leader. And over the course of the past 10 years, I've probably done 600 interviews with people from all different walks of life all over the world. And what's remarkable to me is that no one has ever said that they learned their most important leadership lesson in a business school. And quite often they don't even mention work. People talk about moments in their lives when, for example, um, they lost a parent at an early age. Or they moved from one neighborhood to a new neighborhood and suddenly found that they had to establish themselves again. Or one young woman told me a story about going from being a student of karate to being uh, an instructor of karate. The interesting thing is that these lessons are very powerful to individuals. So for all the experiences that you have, just a few will teach you something very important about yourself as a leader. So we began to say, well, interestingly, if that's what people tell you about as the times in which they learn something important about themselves as a leader, that doesn't mean we abandon business school. That doesn't mean we abandon training. But we do as someone have to bring in personal experience outside of work as well as inside of work as data to be used. Now, the reason why I think these crucible experiences are so important is that in many ways what they do is that they teach you that you have to change your behavior. And you may deny that you're really right. And I've had lots of people who are very modest, very accomplished, but very modest, say, I'm not, I'm not really a leader. But if I ask them the question, tell me a time you learned something important about yourself as a leader, they always have a story to tell. They've always had to lead something. Now, you may not think of yourself as a leader, but you've had to lead something in your life. And if you didn't do it well, or if you didn't, but you didn't think, you did do it well, but you don't think you could repeat it, the chances are what you discovered is there's something you have to change about your behavior. So people would tell me stories, for example, in which the lesson that they learned was, I need to be able to trust people more. Or I need to pay more attention to the people who work for me. It's not about me, it's really about them. Those lessons may not be new and exciting to the world, but they're new and exciting to the individual who experienced them. So people tend to learn two lessons in their crucible experiences. One, they learn a lesson about leading. Second is they learn a lesson about learning, about how they learn best. What are the circumstances under which they learn? So that really became part of the, the conclusion that we drew from this research, which is that learning usually has to do with adaptation. Adaptation usually has to do with practicing something new. The question is, under what conditions will people practice something new? Now, we've had the opportunity over the course of the past six, seven years to work with a wide variety of companies in which we've taken that core idea and built it into their leadership development process. Doing things like action learning projects, creating action labs in which people take their insights about how they learn and apply them to the way in which they're attempting to do, to do new things at work. We've created things called practice fields. And the whole point of practice is that you need a place in which you can practice, but rather than making practice an activity that you carry out off to the side, we make work a practice field. So case in point, at Unilever, we've initiated with the top 100 executives globally a program of what we refer to as purpose to impact initiatives. 
you heard Scott Snook from Harvard Business School, and then later Bill George from Harvard Business School talk about the importance of purpose. A reason why you want to leave. A reason why you're trying to improve the world. As being at the center of everything. But Unilever put a lot of emphasis on helping their leaders get clear about what they're trying to accomplish in this world. But now they wanted to take it to the next level, which is to say, it's not enough that you have a clear sense of what your purpose is. It's not enough for you to be an authentic leader. You also have to have impact. So the second wave of the work that we're doing with Unilever has to do with practice, but on a, on a very large scale. They're introducing new products into new markets. They're introducing new ways of doing innovation. They are, in effect, building the new company at the same time that they're building the next generation of leaders. So that the initiatives that they're undertaking are really the next generation of company called Unilever. And it's all built from this set of ideas, our observations about how it is that people learn how they learn to lead. The second thing we learn, second C, is that if you're going to practice in order to change your behavior, you have to be committed to practice. Now, does anybody in this room play a musical instrument? Yeah? You don't have to play it now, but does anybody, <laughs> does anybody play a musical instrument? Yeah. Do, any of, do any of you play band? Yeah, yeah. yeah, any of you play golf? Be good at anything, but anything that is not natural to you requires practice. The problem is that most people quit practicing before they see results. They're too impatient. And I'll give you a personal example. Um, I think this past month I started my, my 12th weight loss campaign. Yeah, sure. Because I always quit before I see results. <laughs> so the problem for many people is that they will attend a marvelous seminar. They'll go off to a training program. They'll read a, a truly inspirational book. And in that moment, they will commit themselves to change. And then, unfortunately, life intervenes. They get busy, they get diverted, other things occur. It doesn't feel comfortable to practice in the middle of, the, of a working day. People ask you, what are you doing that's different? And over time, the commitment is erased. And you end up in this very, very uncomfortable situation where you want to improve your performance, but you don't have time to practice which is a lot where a lot of us find ourselves. It's what in English we refer to as a, a double bind. You're in hot water if you do, you're hot in hot water if you don't. You must do something different. Well, I began doing research on high performers in a wide variety of fields, but particularly in the performing arts. Because I've always been convinced that leadership is a kind of performing art. It's like singing. It's like dancing. It requires practice. It requires a sense of confidence. It is about expressing something that you think is important and beautiful. It's your vision or it's the company's vision. But leaders have to perform. So here's the dilemma, as I said, if you don't have time to practice, it's hard to imagine you improving your performance. The only way out of that trap is to learn how to practice while you perform. Practice while you perform. If you talk to someone who's an extraordinary dancer or a musician, they don't make a big distinction between practice and performance. To practice means you're preparing for performance. To perform means that you're noticing what it is that you did practice and what you need to practice. So in many respects, what we've tried to do is to build into 
leadership development the idea that you must commit to practicing. And the responsibility of a leadership development program is to give you space in which to practice. Now, practice will never demonstrate benefit unless you can measure the results. Hence, one of the things we put a huge amount of emphasis on is measurement. That demonstrates to you that you actually have improved your performance. Because when you get that evidence, it's almost like you turn a flywheel and the momentum builds. For any of you who ever gotten better at playing a sport or better at cooking, better at playing with your children, you know that once you achieve a certain level of accomplishment, it gets easier and more interesting to improve your performance. So that's what we've been trying to do with companies, is to create measures of things that are often very small, but constitute evidence of improvement. The third thing that, yeah, the third thing we want to, we come to focus on is the idea that when you practice, you've got to practice two things. The outside game and the inside game. The outside game is acquiring skills. So let me just ask you, what are some of the skills that you would want a leader to acquire? How to, how to influence people. How to motivate people. What else? Convince other people to say something. To convince other people. To convince other people to be persuasive. What else? When someone uses the term leader, what comes to mind? What, what immediately comes to your mind? Direct. Someone's directive provides direction. Someone who may be courageous, willing to take risks. Someone who listens very well, listens to his or her people. Someone who cares. What I'm going to suggest to you is that those are things we refer to as outside skills. The ability to give a speech, the ability to provide feedback, the ability to provide direction, to formulate a vision. Those are skills like learning how to draw a bow across the strings of your violin or the swing your golf club. Those are the learnable skills. But then the inside game is your purpose. It's the answer that you develop to the question, why do you lead? What are you trying to accomplish? The reason why I make this distinction is because we often talk about situational leadership. That is being able to read situations, understand what's required to deliver the right skill or the right idea or the right direction at a given moment in time. Well, in that respect, what's powerful about leaders who are skilled on the outside and yet have a purpose on the inside is that they can combine those skills in productive ways, in creative ways, in the right way to respond to a situation. So among the things that we try to do is to encourage people to develop their skills, but also to develop their inside skills, their inside gains, which is the point that Unilever was making about what is your purpose? Why do you want to lead? What's your vision of the future? So we've created that as a set of opportunities inside of leadership development programs, uh, both around the concrete competencies that an organization expects of its leaders, but also around the maturity of vision that one would hope that a leader would have. Fourth C is coaching. <coughs> One of the interesting things that we learned in our interviews with older and younger leaders, leaders in very different businesses, is that people rarely learn alone. Almost invariably, there's somebody else there. You may not be a teacher, you may not be a mentor, but someone like a boss, a good friend, who simply points out to you the 
there's something important, important happening here, pay attention to it. That there's an opportunity for you to learn something in this moment of stress, in this moment of trial, in this moment of test. Learn it. Notice it. Or someone who afterward, perhaps even months afterward, helps you make sense of the experience that you've had. And again, not a mentor, not an expert necessarily, but someone who cares enough about you to help you learn. And that's really what a coach is. It doesn't have to be called a coach, but someone who will help you arrive at an understanding of something important that's happened to you. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. Just, just uh, want to know uh, how is the effectiveness of coaching? Because uh, usually uh, we can really develop if we explore ourselves, uh, if we learn a lot by ourselves. But coaching, uh, how effective coaching? Well, people will learn in very different ways. And some people don't need a coach. Uh, however, the value of a coach is that it's he or she is, is like someone sitting on your shoulder uh, and periodically asking you questions. Questions about, is this something that you really ought to learn? You've said you want to accomplish this. Are you really accomplishing it? It's a combination of both a reminder and a conscience, but also someone who really cares uh, that you achieve the goals you set for yourself. So the effectiveness, well we've done research in various places on the effectiveness of coaching and can discover that particularly when you compare 360 performance reviews from one cycle to the next, people who have been coached demonstrate real progress uh, against the areas that, that are their challenges or, or are their weaknesses, statistically more effective with a coach than without a coach. It's still an area where a lot of research needs to be done, but I find it fascinating that, that um, of all the fields within leadership development, the one that's growing fastest is coaching both in terms of revenue and in terms of the number of hours spent. Uh, I think that when you have people like Eric Schmidt, who was up until recently the CEO of Google, saying publicly that I've, in the last 20 years I've had a, a coach and he has made it possible for me to take on challenges that I would not have taken on without a coach, that kind of affirmation is, is hugely powerful. For those of you who, who watch golf, or, you know, I'm a big Tiger Woods fan from, from many years back. Uh, and Tiger used to be used to speak uh, as a spokesperson for Accenture until he ran into trouble. Uh, but Tiger Woods, arguably one of the best golfers in, in recent memory, to this day has two different coaches. One for his swing, uh, and the other is for his physical development, his physical well-being. So someone who is at, absolutely at the top of their game still has a coach, that tells me something very important. So what we've tried to do is to say, well, coaching shouldn't be an expensive undertaking. Instead, coaching ought to be built into what leaders do. So that arguably, leaders need coaches, but the people who work for leaders need coaches too. Which is one of the reasons why with the Tata Group, for example, in India, we've spent a significant amount of time developing a program that we call Captains to Coaches. Indian uh, business people in particular love cricket, and so anything that has to do with cricket is a great story for them. And the interesting thing about moving from being a cricket captain to a cricket coach is that you, you leave the pitch, you no longer play, but you still play an absolutely critical role in strategy, in developing the skills and competencies of other players. So quite often, 
captains become coaches. And what we try to do with the captains to coaches program at the Tata Group is to help very senior executives be more effective coaches, particularly of younger people. And as a matter of fact, we've begun to pioneer the idea of a reverse coaching program. You may have tried this yourself, the PLN, where we pair young people with much more senior executives, and they work out an exchange. The senior executives will be a leadership coach, and the younger uh, employees will be a technology coach. And teach them how to use all these new things like Twitter, Facebook, <laughs> and it's remarkable the way that works, that exchange. But one of the things we've also discovered is that many mentoring programs fail because we're not dedicated enough to training people how to be effective mentors. We often assume that simply because you're, you have gray hair, that you learn things that you can teach other people. That is not a guarantee. Gray hair guarantees nothing. <laughs> but equally important, we also have to train mentees or protégés because a good protégé can make a average mentor into a much better one by the questions that they ask, by the attitude that they adopt, so part of the goal, from my perspective, is to, to make mentors better at coaching, listening, guiding, not telling stories, but answering questions, and then asking questions, and to make protégés good at not just listening, but asking questions that will bring the best out of a mentor. Now again, all of this is in service of growing more leaders faster. Not talking about what I want them to learn, it's about how they learn that matters to me. And that brings me to, finally to, to the fifth C, which is community. We often think of leadership as a very lonely activity. An individual leader facing a challenge. If you ever read a Harvard Business Review article, particularly a Harvard Business Review case, it's almost invariably about a single leader who is looking out the window, facing some significant challenge and trying to figure out how to take care of their organization, how to solve problems of the world. Well, in fact, what we believe is that if you are successful at growing leaders, you'll create a community of leaders. And that community of leaders will grow more leaders faster. So that means, among other things, that we need people who are going to be committed to their growth and to the organizational growth, but we also need to measure the performance. So for example, I've had the opportunity to work uh, at MIT, where we created a program called the Leaders for Manufacturing. The first two classes had 50 students each. After two years, we had 100 alumni. After 20 years, we had 1,500 alumni. Those alumni meet every year. And they take as their agenda for their annual meeting, learning new things. Supporting each other as leaders, but most importantly, learning new things. So any company that has a program like yours has the capacity to create a community of leaders. People who have a common experience, people who learn a common set of ideas, people who support one another in practicing those ideas at work. So one of the things that we insist on is that leaders have to teach other leaders. That means we rely less on faculty and more on executives to do the leading and the teaching. So what we've tried to do in these five C's is to give you a better sense of how it is that this, this approach works. Now, I would be dishonest if I didn't tell you that we also, we also try and apply this set of ideas inside of Accenture. Because the reality is that we often use our own company as a pilot site for our ideas. 
as we say, we, we have to eat our own cooking. And what's been amazing over the past 15 years that I've been part of Accenture is that we have applied this set of ideas to developing leaders that have been remarkably successful, not just inside of Accenture, but in companies that hire them from us. We found ourselves, like General Electric, being a, what we refer to as a net exporter of leaders. Yeah. We grow them and then they leave. <laughs> now, at some level, people would be concerned about that, but the reality is that we've been able to create a pipeline of leaders in the organization. At the core of their experience is something we refer to as LDP, our Leadership Development Program. But this Leadership Development Program brings together aspiring executives, mostly senior managers, from all over the world to work on initiatives that are strategically important to the company. So this is not about doing something that is a team project that has no impact, but these are, on an annual basis, between 8 and 15 initiatives that are identified by the board of directors as being critical to our company and we put our best talent against those. So over the course of approximately 12 months, they not only learn critical leadership skills, but they learn how to work across boundaries, across cultures, across geographies, across businesses to be able to solve critical problems for Accenture. The, the leadership development program that we've created is in many ways significant also uh, because Accenture is a professional services company. Not unlike an investment bank. And if you know anything about the banking industry, particularly investment banking, um, you know that most people who are in those banking jobs, those investment jobs, um, have very little interest in management. They want to make as much money as they possibly can. They love the challenge of interesting assignments. Often we refer to them as challenge junkies, meaning that they go from a challenging problem to another challenging problem, and that's the way in which they, they grow, and that's where they get their, their greatest uh, satisfaction. But because they're challenge junkies, no one wants to manage the business. They want to do the interesting things. In an investment bank like Goldman Sachs, Quite often, if someone says they're going into management, everyone else looks at them and, and sort of in sympathy and says, well, you must no longer be any good at your job if you're going into management. <laughs> so to find people who are willing and able to lead in that environment, where they've got to challenge themselves and others continuously, is quite an accomplishment. And I think the success that we've experienced has been largely a product of the fact that we are teaching the way people learn. Not the way they should learn, but the way they actually learn, which is through practice. Let me move on to just give you a sense of some of the, the companies we've worked with. And, and again, this is not an advertisement for Accenture, but it is to say that the same set of ideas have worked in very different industries, uh, including in government service, uh, in state-owned enterprises. One of my personally most satisfying uh, situations that I worked with was in a, a state-owned enterprise <coughs> in India in the late 1990s, uh, a company called Bharat Petroleum. Uh, Bharat went from being a state-owned enterprise to being a publicly traded company with a very strong customer focus in the course of three years. And in the process, created a cadre of leaders which to this day continues to win awards and top positions throughout Indian industry. So the fact that it was a state-owned enterprise didn't mean that people couldn't learn to lead. They could, and they did. So the kinds of, of, of outcomes that we're accustomed to looking to, well, that's right, just leave it, leave it, leave it. Uh, the types of, of, of outcomes that we try and orient people to looking for whether from us or from any other university or corporate university, 
is that we need to see a visible change in behavior if we're going to be successful. The visible change has to take the form of, of sound decision making with a strategic focus. Increasingly these days, it's data driven decision making. The ability to effectively delegate. One of the things that we argue is that it's important to think about leadership, but it's also important to think about followership. And followership is kind of an unusual word, but it says that it's not just the leader's responsibility to get things done. Followers have a responsibility. And good followers, like a good protege, can make a good leader into a great leader. Because they ask the right questions, they provide the right guidance, they're constantly providing feedback. And you know from your own experience, when you get into a leadership position, one of the things that you almost immediately give up is feedback. Because either people are afraid to give you, to tell you the truth, uh, or because you quietly shut it down. So one of the things we're particularly concerned about is in the process of delegation, that people create space <coughs> for followers to be effective followers. We're very much concerned about relationship building as well as a performance orientation. Sunil and I have, have spent a lot of time talking about uh, what we refer to as the three pillars of leadership. Uh, research that we've done with well over 20,000 leaders globally identifies three critical things that leaders need to build capability around. Again, I'm, this is, I'm going to veer into the what as opposed to the how, but the what is important. One is they have to have a vision. <coughs> and they have to be able to communicate that vision. Now, the remarkable thing about some leaders is that they're more able to create a vision through interaction than simply by themselves. They find the things that other people want to accomplish, and they build a story that incorporates that. Shared vision. The second thing is they have to be relationship builders. Even if they're introverted, they have to find ways in which to bring the parts of the organization together. That means, among other things, they have to genuinely care about people. And then finally, they have to be masters of execution, which is very much concerned about results. Because a vision in the absence of results is just a fantasy. Relationships in the absence of results is just a club. And therefore, the challenge for many leaders is if they're not equally good at those three things, they either have to practice or they have to surround themselves with people who complete them. And finally, we, we try to encourage leaders to have the resilience to make change. One of the things that the, the folks at Unilever have emphasized as being important for the future is resilience. One of my favorite quotes from General George Patton, who was a, a legendary figure in World War II, he said, success is measured by how high you bounce after you hit the bottom how well you bounce back from failure. That's what success is all about. And someone who has not failed doesn't know what that means. So resilience, as it turns out, is, is not simply can you dust yourself off, get up, and try again, but can you create that capability in the people around you as well? Because, as we know, we look forward into the future, companies are going to have to be far more experimental than ever before. With technology, with go-to-market strategies, with ways in which they create products for their customers. Which means that they're going to fail much more often than ever before. But they've got to fail and come back. And that's why I think in some respects the big lesson from our research in high performance business has been that high performers fail and bounce back. It's not like they're uniformly successful. They do fail, but they bounce back. The same has to do with leaders. What we also know is that 
leaders in the future are going to need to have differentiated skills, functional skills, business skills, cultural skills and capabilities. They need to understand their industry and their industry dynamics. You know that. They need to understand their business. But the challenge is going to be that many businesses are changing. The boundaries between businesses are changing. I do a lot of, of research on new technology, which I'll describe briefly in a moment. But one of the things that we found through working with companies like General Electric and Siemens and a, a variety of others is that electrical utilities, power generation companies, are going to find themselves changing dramatically the way in which they operate in the not too distant future. Why? Because of the availability of data. The fact that sensors will be ubiquitous, they will be everywhere. And your capacity to experiment in real time, your capacity to vary the operation of a facility is going to increase. Your capacity to respond to business opportunities will increase. That means leaders will have to be masters of experimentation, not just masters of ex execution. You're going to need to be able to have, introduce innovative goals and innovative practices as well. So that's one of the reasons why when we look at the evolution of industries, we're seeing new forms of industry emerging. If you look in Africa these days, one of the biggest banks is a mobile telephone company, Vodafone, and its program called M-Pesa. If you look at the way in which the global positioning system industry has changed. The biggest player is Google, not TomTom or Garmin. The foundation of competition uh, is no longer bring in a cheaper alternative and work your way up the value chain. It's increasingly, you introduce into the market a product which is better, faster, and cheaper at the same time. So if you look at what happened to the GPS industry, where people spent hundreds of dollars for a little screen that they put on the dash of their car or built into their car, overnight it evaporated when Google came out with an application which it gave away for free. It cost nothing, it worked a lot better, and you could take it anywhere you wanted. Suddenly, in a period of six months or less, $17 billion in market cap, in the case of Garmin, completely erased, <coughs> gone away. And we're going to see more of that. I had the opportunity yesterday to spend some time with um, colleagues at a, a, a port and container company. And I said, if you look out to the future, do you think there's always going to be a demand for okay. containers and for the heavy equipment necessary to move it? And they said, well, of course. And I said, well, have any of you heard of 3D printing? Yes. Well, in the not too distant future, my suit of clothes will be printed. It won't be manufactured in Guangzhou. It won't be shipped in a container to the United States. It will take the form of a software program app, which is the design, ones and zeros, that will drive a 3D printer that will print my suit. If that's the case, what do I need a container ship for? Why do I need a container ship? So part of what I'm suggesting to you is, I'm sure you ask these questions of yourself. What alternative sources of energy might be out there that could prevent us from existing in the not too distant future. That's a leader's job. That's what it means to bring the future into the room. Now, a big piece of what we're talking about is, is an interesting new formulation. If you look on the, the right-hand side of that slide, you see three concentric circles. The business impact, societal impact, and personal impact overlapping. When we began doing work with Unilever several years ago, we had a meeting with the CEO of the company, his name is Paul Pullman. And 
all has been very, very visible in the marketplace and World Economic Forum in many different places arguing for sustainable growth. And so I drew on a chalkboard three circles that intersected, a Venn diagram, business, society, personal. And I said, here's this intersecting space that you're trying to fill. And his response was to get out of his chair, go over and grab the eraser, erase everything I put on the wall, and said, nope, you've got it entirely wrong. It needs to look like that. <laughs> That you can no longer be an independent player if you're a business. You have to contribute to society. If your goal is to enhance society, you need to do it by the tools of business. And if your goal is to improve your neighborhood, yourself, then you need to find ways to accomplish that through business. So what they've done is created a picture in which their sustainable living plan their effort to try and improve the livelihood of young men and women around the world, their effort to try and grow their business is their business model. It's no longer CSR or community improvement or societal benefit in the business. They have to be simultaneous. And that becomes the job for leaders. So one of the things that I have been doing well, one of the things I have been doing, one of the bits of research that I've been doing, uh, that I wanted to share with you, and I'll come back to it in a moment, uh, is some research on what changes about leadership in a world that is so thoroughly dominated by new technology. Thoroughly dominated by new technology. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas. Yeah, yes. Okay. Before we come to the, the new slide that you are going to give, I, I would like to ask... Uh, questions about things that is quite important for the business nowadays, as you see about the coaching, a part of the what Mr. Alwan asked just now, is I would like to to see about the, the real world of coach here and the practice amongst the success company. Okay, could, could you share a little bit about the, how uh, the companies such as uh, Unilever or General Electric in doing or in practice the coach from one a superior to the, to the followers and something like that. Because in my opinion, uh, nowadays because of so, as you think, so much competition and then so much the orientation that we want to cover, sometimes we don't have a time for that. Right. Okay, thank you. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. It's a question that, that was asked many, many times <laughs> Sorry, in, in, the er in the early days of all of our efforts. <laughs> And it was interesting, what, in the case of the Tata group, for example, uh, Ratan Tata, who was recently retired as, as the uh, chairman and managing director of the Tata group, uh, was, was looking forward to retirement. He was looking back on his career. And he told us that the one thing he regretted most was that he hadn't spent enough time developing the next generation or two of leaders. Now, said, look, we have a leadership succession program. So we have a pretty good sense of who, what the talent is and, and where they are and what experiences they've had. Um, but he said, I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about the people who are going to be our leaders 20 years from now. He said, now I can't tell you who in this room is going to be leading this company 10 or 15 or 20 years from now. He said, but I know that that person is probably in this room. Hope so. Oh, so. He said, so, so he asked the question, what are we doing to bring that person along faster? Because he looked at the curriculum of leadership development program, and it all looked very reasonable. Uh, he looked at their, plot, their process for moving and rotating people amongst positions. He said, it seems very reasonable. But what he worried about was that the process of education was, in his terms, episodic. What he meant by that was, you have a three-week program here, you have a two-day program here, you have a two-year rotation there, but the process of learning ought to be continuous. Because the kinds of things, and this is where he and I very clearly agreed, 
as, as well as uh, Mr. Gopal, Gopal Krishnan, who was his, his, his right-hand person when he came to this, the thing we agreed about very directly was you know, that people have opportunities to learn every day. So under what conditions can we help them learn every day? Well, the research that I've done and come to this, to this conclusion that people rarely learn alone. So what you need to have is individuals and a community which are dedicated to learning. So this now comes to the issue of how do you get busy executives to be effective coaches? We sat with 20 of the top executives at the topic group. And we asked them, what do you think you can do to grow leaders more effectively? Because you're not leadership gurus. You're not specialists in the field. But what you've learned over the years are some skills about how to identify effective leaders and how to help bring them along. What are you capable of doing? And a number of them said, you know, one of our biggest skills, if we're smart, is we listen. We don't tell, we listen. The joke in the U.S. is, you know, that God gave you two ears and one mouth, you know, and use them in proportion. <laughs> and the dilemma that they pointed out is that we grow leaders and tell them to talk all the time. <laughs> Not to listen. So if you're going to listen, what are you going to listen for? And they stopped and they said, we're going to listen for aspirations. We're going to listen for desire. We're going to listen for hope. People will come to us with questions, but more often than not, they have answers already. So our goal is to get them to articulate those answers. And again, the principle, whether it's in the Christian Bible or in the Quran or any other spiritual tone, applies. If you teach a man to fish, he can feed himself. Well, in a sense, what they began to realize was that their job was not to instruct. Their job was to listen. Their job was not to give direction to leaders, young leaders, all the time. Their job was to guide. Not tell them what to do, but guide them. Uh, their job wasn't to instruct. Their job was to hold up a mirror. Now, for many of them, the challenge was that meant listening instead of talking. So we created a program, two and a half days. Uh, the principal objective was how to listen. <laughs> Two and a half days about how to listen. Now, you know from your own experience dealing with your children that children have nothing but questions. And that's, I'm glad that they do. Because often children teach us things that we don't know by the questions that they ask. But a good parent knows that if you ask the right question of a child, he or she will search out the answer themselves. And so in many respects, the Captains to Coaches program at, at Tata Group is focused on the idea that, that the people we want to grow already have answers. Maybe not the best answers, maybe not the right answers, but unless they learn how to search, They'll always be relying on us to give them the answers. So how does this come to be attractive? Well, yes, we spent two and a half days teaching people how to listen. Uh, but we didn't spend two months. We took a skill that everyone had and helped them use it in a new way. And as Sunil can tell you, it was hilarious. It was quite comical in some instances, where we had very senior executives. I remember the, uh, the head of Tata Steel, an extraordinarily impressive, accomplished man, <coughs> being told by another one of his colleagues, the Rooker, if you don't shut up, <laughs> you'll never learn. And here was someone who 
no one would challenge. And he stepped back and said, you know, you're right. I'm not listening. I need to listen. So when it comes to an organization, at some level what we do is say, we have something very simple to teach it. You'll all agree it's simple. And you'll find it very difficult to do. You need to learn how to listen. Now, if anyone has ever taken a meditation course, or a course in yoga, one of the things you learn is how to breathe. Most of us think that breathing is natural, right? Yes. We're pretty good at it. Nobody is falling over in this room. Thank you, Thomas. But you know that, that breathing is not just about intaking air. Yes? Uh, since uh, we are discussing about leadership, I'm, I'm just... Uh, Curious uh, about uh, the three leaders, uh, Richard Branson as the CEO of Virgins, and also the Tony Fernandez, uh, Air Asia, and in another country, uh, Rudy Kiran. I think those three leaders uh, are quite special because plane or aircraft business is uh, uh, needed huge investment, but how come uh, they can decide uh, of this is the right business they have to, to take? Because back to uh, your presentation here, the, the characters of leaders comprising of adaptability, result-oriented, resilience, authenticity, and the last is forgot. So uh, how those three leaders apply this? In, in the development, because I think the three leaders are, are, are very brave entering uh, the plane industry. So, what is your view? Systemic thinking. Well, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if, if, I, if I knew, if I knew, <laughs> I would be investing in, in, in those people. I would not be spending my time with you. Right? <laughs> But, I, but I, have, I do have a view on that. Uh, most really accomplished leaders uh, don't know how they do what they do. They don't. Uh, you know, they, there's a, another fellow in the airline industry who was a, a, something of a legend in the United States by, named, by the name of Robert Crandall, Bob Crandall. And he ran American Airlines for many years. And he was the one who introduced super safer fares. You know, you, the longer you, you pay, I mean, you pay before you go to your trip. The further out the trip is, the less you pay, et cetera, et cetera. He introduced the loyalty programs, frequent flyer miles, and that sort of thing. And I once asked him, I said, uh, Bob, how did you learn to do what you do? Because you, you seem to make the right choices at the right moment in time. Uh, how does that work? What, do you do? Do you go off into a room by yourself and meditate? Do you? Uh, and, how do you do this? And he looked at me and said, "I have no idea." And I said, "Well, but you do it repeatedly, so you must have some idea." And his response was, "Honestly, don't know." So I said, "Okay, well then let's let's." Let's talk about something that you really enjoy doing um, outside of work. He said, okay. I said, so what do you really like to do when you have free time? So I love to sail my boat. Oh, okay. I said, so when you first started sailing, were you really good at it? No. He said, I sank my first two boats. <laughs> I said, well, that, that could have been frustrating. He said, it was very frustrating. I said, so what did you do? He said, I got somebody to teach me how to sail. I said, was that pleasant? He said, no, I hate having other people tell me what to do. He said, but my vision of myself sailing out on the open ocean was strong enough that I decided I'll stick with it. So he learned how to sail, he got a, a new boat, and then he noticed that other people had crews of other people who were sailing bigger boats. So he could sail his boat by himself, but he didn't have a crew, and he wanted to have a bigger boat. So he signed up to be a crew member on somebody else's boat. 
and he learned everything he needed to know. And I said, well, was that pleasant? He said, no. He said, because somebody was always telling me what to do. I wanted to be the one telling people what to do. He said, but I learned a great deal in the process. He said, then I got a bigger boat. He said, and then I began to realize that the people who really knew how to sail were people who gathered after their sailing and talked about the conditions under which they sailed, what the weather was like, how they read a map, how they read the wind. He said, I began hanging out with them because they could tell me things that I never would have understood when I started, but which I can understand now. He said, so I started building up a network of people who really loved to sail, and sail in conditions I'd never encountered before. And I learned from them. And so I stopped him at that moment and I said, well, Bob, tell me, is there any similarity at all between learning to sail and learning to run a successful business? For you. He said, absolutely. He said, but I never would have described my experience learning to run a business that way. But I never thought about it that way. He said, and it's very similar. So one of the things I'm keen to understand, particularly amongst senior executives, senior leaders, business people, entrepreneurs in general, is how do they read the wind? How, what are the things that they look for as indicators that there's an opportunity? And do any of you sail? A little bit, maybe? You know, one of the things that I, I find marvelous about sailing is that you notice the way the wind affects the water. And that gives you an insight as to where the wind is. So you look out across a body of water, and if you see the water disturbed, you know that the wind is blowing there. So you point your boat in that direction and you move your sails in order to catch that wind. So in many ways, what he was telling me is that I read the market the same way I read the water. Now, again, that doesn't tell me how he makes the decision to invest in this versus this. It does tell me the way he sails. And I think there's a great similarity between the two. Which is one of the reasons why I strongly encourage people to read autobiographies. Sometimes they're, they're you know, glory stories about how wonderful I am. But other times they will give you insight into the way people develop judgment. And it strikes me that, that that's the area where we need to work most when it comes to developing leaders is developing their judgment, their ability to make choices, to take chances, reasonable chances, and the way in which they learn from those. Mark, I mean, um, uh, Noel Tishy and Warren Bennis wrote a lovely book called Judgment. Uh, and what they do is they take instances of big challenges faced within companies like General Electric and Procter and & Gamble and a variety of others, and they go through the history of a decision to try and understand why they made the choice the way they did. Now, Tishy, Noel Tishy is a, is a kind of an engineer, so he likes to put everything in diagrams. Uh, I don't think that's the way the world works, but it's an easy way to represent it. And one of the things that Tishy argues is that leaders who demonstrate judgment actually have very rich personal networks. And I'll tell you a story that illustrates this. And unfortunately, Sue Neal has heard this story 200 times. But have any of you ever heard of a, a, a guy named Andy Fastow? I mean, you're in the electrical business, so you may have heard. You ever heard of a company called Enron? Well, Andy Fastow was the, the chief financial officer for Enron. So he's kind of like, when you're, when you're doing illegal things, he's doing the most illegal things. <laughs> Well, I interviewed Andy Fastow before he went to jail, before Enron evaporated and he went to jail. Uh, and I wasn't interested in Enron, per se. Uh, it was a company that everybody was writing about being a new, exciting company, and he was a new, exciting leader. 
I was interested in just understanding what people he called upon to help him make dif difficult choices. Because that was a study I was doing in, in Silicon Valley and in a variety of other places. So I asked him a question. I said, Andy, when you're facing something you've never seen before, to whom do you turn for advice? Reasonable question. He looked at me in the eye and he said, myself. Well, let me ask you, if, so, if somebody, you ask somebody, who do you turn to for advice, and they say, me, what does that imply? What does that tell you? Selfish. Selfish, egotistical. Now, at the time, I also thought to myself, well, nope, maybe I'm missing something, because in other circumstances, they might say, he's self-reliant. He, he trusts himself. But like you, I had similar kind of suspicions. I began to think, well, hold it. If he only relies on himself, then he's got a very limited amount of data to work with. Well, if you look at instances where people have gotten into trouble, done something illegal, unethical, immoral, three conditions show up over and over again. One, they're under tremendous pressure. Two, they have very little time. And three, they don't have alternative sources of perspective and information. So they get stuck. Your boss wants you to do it. You've got to do it tomorrow. You don't know where to turn. You're going to probably make the wrong choice. So in my mind, as in the case of Tishy's and, and Dennis's in their book on judgment, their view is that leaders need to have the richest set of resources available to them, the richest set of advisors available to them. Now, in, in, the, in an organization called the Young uh, President's Organization, YPO, which you may have heard of, basically it's an organization made up of entrepreneurs, people who start their own companies. They have something that they refer to as your personal board of directors. <clears throat> Now, in a company, we know why you, have a why you have a board of directors. You need people who have experience. You have people who have diversity of experience and different skills so that the CEO, the chairman, and other members can turn to them for advice. A personal board of directors is a group of people who you turn to for advice. And the remarkable thing about them the most important characteristic is that there are people who care enough about you to tell you the truth. That's one of the reasons why I don't encourage people to put their wife or husband on their personal board of directors. Not that they'll lie to you, but that they have an interest in you being happy. So sometimes they won't tell you the truth. I encourage people to look for people on their personal board of directors outside of their company. Sometimes it's a religious figure, sometimes it's a, a distant family member, sometimes it's somebody you went to school with. I mean, often MBA programs are good for that sort of thing, generating a group of people you can turn to for advice. And the reason why I emphasize that is because if you're faced with a situation in which you don't know what to do, which is common amongst leaders, you need to have time, you need to be able to relieve the pressure, and you need somehow to increase the variety of resources of information and perspective that are available to you. So one of the things I strongly encourage is to develop your own personal board of directors. So to get back to your point, you know, there are, there are people who are masterful um, and who cannot, ex cannot explain why they do it and how they do what they do. Uh, and the ones who can explain often don't teach. You wish they would. But if I look at Tiger Woods, or if I look at um, uh, Pablo Picasso, or if I look at you know, your, your international badminton champions, if I look at and people who are extraordinary at what they do, if they can explain how they do it, they are a national treasure. But if they can't, that doesn't mean they're, they're not smart it means that you probably have to find another way to get them to explain. Kind of like I had to do with Bob Cranmer. 
So when it comes to CEOs and senior executives, you know, oftentimes they're not good at explaining how they do what they do. Uh, they're not. Uh, and often you can't learn just by watching them because you don't know all, everything that's going on. So you need to be really good at asking questions. It's important for, for coaches. It's also important for protégés. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about is, is some interesting things that are going on in the world of business driven by technology that I think have implications for leadership. Accenture does a lot of work in technology and, and I'm interested in those kinds of issues. So what we've been looking at is, is what is it going to take to lead the digital enterprise? What changes about the task of leadership in an environment in which more and more you have data about everything? Well, I've had the opportunity to spend some time with leaders in, in digital companies, software companies, uh, machine companies that, like General Electric, uh, companies that are developing new monitoring and sensoring, sensing technologies, companies that are applying them in data and analytics. And I've been asking them, what do they think will be different about their companies 10 years from now? And what will be the consequences for people who lead those companies? And so far, we've come up with four things that seem to be relevant. One is that leaders will have to become increasingly edge aware. Now, that's not even a simple thing to say in English. What does that mean, edge aware? Well, think about it yourselves. These days, consumers often have more information than manufacturers do about the performance of products. If you go to buy a new cell phone, a new mobile phone, not only do you talk to your friends about, is that a good phone, but you go online and you look up all the ratings of that phone. And what you come to discover is that there's an enormous amount of information out there about virtually any product. When I teach in a classroom, my students routinely have their laptops up and if I say, well, you know, Google is the, is the, has the world's largest market cap, they'll be checking to see whether or not I'm right. <laughs> and if I'm not, they'll be raising their hand and saying, no, actually, you're wrong. <laughs> there isn't anything I say that they won't check. Well, that's, that's uncomfortable in a classroom environment. <laughs> but think of how uncomfortable, how uncomfortable it will be in the future in a business environment. Where the CEO of the company says, we're heading into difficult financial straits, and everybody looks up the reports, they look up the annual, they look up the performance of the company, and they say, we don't seem to be in such bad shape. What's he talking about? Or analysts will be able to do exactly the same thing. You know, we're finding this out from so many different places. I had the opportunity to, uh, to spend some time with the managing director of Al Jazeera, familiar with Al Jazeera, the television network. And Al Jazeera was for many years fed all the information they got from various governments in the Middle East. They were funded by the government of Qatar. But in the Arab Spring, all that evaporated and suddenly Al Jazeera didn't have any news. But they believed themselves to be legitimate journalists so they had to find alternative sources of information. And if you recall the reports that were coming from Tripoli and from Lebanon and from Jordan and from Egypt, where were those reports coming from? Who was providing the news? Do you recall? People with mobile phones. They were providing the video. They were providing the commentary. They were providing all the information. Suddenly Al Jazeera found itself in a situation where it had to source news from an entirely new place. So when I talk about edge aware, I'm talking about organizations in which more and more of the information will be available outside of the organization than ever before. Which means that leaders are going to have to delegate responsibility in ways that they have. The data that's available to them will allow for decentralization of decision making. If you look at convenience stores like 7-Eleven, Increasingly, 
Choices about inventory are made at the level of the store, not central. Uh, the business model that brought 7-Eleven into being was we have one central buying organization and we ship everything out to these franchise stores. But one of the things they discovered was that there was a lot of money to be made by stocking locally relevant products, but they wouldn't do it because it made the procurement process all that much more complicated. But nowadays, with electronic ordering and visibility into their inventory, both for the franchisees as well as the suppliers, they are dramatically diversifying the number of products, not paying more in the process, and generating huge, huge increases in revenue by selling the things that people want in their neighborhood. So they don't lose the economy of scale, but they, get, they garner, they get the benefit of being able to do niche marketing. So what I'm suggesting to you is that the availability of data is actually going to drive decision making further out from the center to the edges, including in your business as well. So that means leaders will have to be much more aware of what's going on at the edges of their organization. Second is that they're going to have to be far better at synthesis than ever before. Howard Gardner, who's a professor at, at uh, Harvard University in the School of Education, wrote a wonderful book called Five Minds for the Future. And he's basically saying that, that in the future we're going to need to have five very different ways of looking at the, at the world in any organization if it's going to be successful. And one of those minds, he argues, is the synthetic mind. People who are capable of bringing together very different kinds of information and finding patterns. So you talk about data mining, you talk about any of a set of activities that have to do with using multiple streams of data, that is going to become increasingly important in the future. We work, for example, with the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Intelligence in the United States. The FBI is probably one of the biggest users of data in the world. But that data takes many, many different forms. It has to be synthesized to become usable. Well, increasingly, we're, leaders are going to have to be able to synthesize information. Third thing is that they're going to have to be authentic. Now, I use this pairing of words. In English, they're almost opposition to one another. Synthetic and authentic. Synthetic often means artificial. Authentic means real or connected to origins. But leaders will have to have both set of skills to be able to synthesize information and to be authentic, meaning sincere, to have a clear purpose. And they'll have to be sincere and truthful and have a clear purpose because it'll be so easy to find out if they're lying. A friend of mine once said, you know, that it doesn't matter how you get to be moral, you can take the high road or you can take the low road, as long as you end up in the same place. Well, here, in a sense, we're saying we expect that leaders will probably have to be more honest in the future because the ability to find out when they're being dishonest is going to be much greater. It'll be much easier to find that out. And then finally, kind of hard to read, collective intelligence. Uh, meaning that it won't be just about individual leaders anymore. It'll be about leaders together making decisions. But what's interesting about that is that that doesn't mean collectivism, that doesn't mean socialism. What it means is very different thought styles working together to achieve the best possible outcome. Now one of the very different thought styles that I think we're going to encounter in the future is machine intelligence. Machine intelligence. Not human intelligence, but machine intelligence. A very good friend of mine is the chief operating officer of Amazon.com. Uh, and so I asked him, I said, Jeff, his name is Jeff Wilkie, I said, Jeff, what do you think is going to be different in the future? He said, in the not distant future, I'm going to have a machine as part of my leadership team. An intelligent machine. And it's not going to be Watson. It's going to be a system that has access to all the data that my company is generating that can answer questions for me in an instant, 
but at the same time is going to be a part of my team because that brain, that machine intelligence is going to be observing my team all the time. Meaning that it is going to be part of my team, not just a, a calculator, not just a computer, not just a tool, but a part of my team. So the notion of collective intelligence in the future, I argue, is going to be increasingly human and machine intelligence working together, which is a huge challenge for leaders. So in the end, uh, I've spent an awful lot of your time this afternoon. I appreciate your being so patient and <laughs> interested in what I have to say. Um, but I'd love to spend whatever other time I have available with you to to answer any questions that you might have. I know I've said an awful lot of things. So first of all, let me thank you for the chance to join you. And let me ask you. Are there other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Thomas, you mentioned about the uh, followership before. Uh, a couple of years ago, I read this, some articles of, uh, uh, that uh, tell me about how to create uh, leaders by using followership uh, program. Yeah. Do you have any uh, experience or study that uh, tell us about this? Yeah, the, the best article I ever read uh, was an article written by a guy named Robert Kelly. Um, and in the article, I think it was in the Harvard Business Review, but it was entitled In Praise of Followers. In Praise of Followers. And what he basically did is he said, look, think of, of followers falling into of one of four quadrants. One quadrant is, one dimension is, um, do they believe in the leader? And the other is, do they question the leader? And what he argues is that what you really need is people who believe in the leader and yet question the leader. Now the challenge he put forward is that therefore, leaders have to leave themselves open to being questioned. They can't be defensive. They can't be offended when someone asks a question, because questions are really intended to provide correction. Not to challenge, not to debate, not to negate, but to provide direction. So what I think is, is absolutely critical is if you don't think you're getting enough feedback, from your followers, it may very well be that you've never encouraged them to give you feedback. It is so easy to, get, to communicate defensiveness by simply adopting a stance which says, I'm not open, and then saying something entirely the opposite. Go ahead, ask me any question you want. Right? Signal's already there. Don't even try. So again, what I'm, what I'm quite interested in is can you as a leader create a space, a time, a set of relationships in which people feel that they can ask you the important questions. And if you are doing your job as a leader, they're in that quadrant where they follow you even as they question you. That to me is, is a space that honestly I don't think we've done nearly enough to try and explore or to try and train people. But the earlier question about coaching kind of points us in the direction of saying, well, if you're able to listen, then chances are you're able to receive feedback. And to my mind, that's always, you know, you've heard the phrase active listening. And one of the dangerous things about active listening is that you may hear things you don't want to hear. So, yes, I'm really interested in what you have to say, except for that. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. I would like to ask you about the 5C. Uh, in order to implement the 5C, uh, is there a priority to do the first C, like the uh, impossible, or whether we have to do it in the same time for the 5C? Do you have to do it all in, in that order? Is that yes, what you're saying? Or, or we have to do, is there a priority to which, which C first, or we have to do it in the same time that 5C? Well, my, my view is I would encourage you to try and do them all at the same time because they reinforce each other. But you can start any place. You can start anywhere on that. 
you know, I started, I started, excuse me, <clears throat> the, the, the building the ideas around the crucibles because that was a fascinating insight to me. When I, I mentioned at the outset, when we, we talked to leaders over the age of 70 and under the age of 35, they differed on many things. They differed about the definition of success. They differed about the definition of work-life balance. They differed on um, whether they, heroes matter to you or not. But where they agreed was that experience is the best teacher. And so the stories they told were different, separated sometimes by 50 years. Sometimes they were about war. Sometimes they were about karate. Sometimes they were about losing a parent at an early age. Sometimes they were about moving to a new neighborhood. But it was the lessons that were very similar. And the process of learning that was very similar. And, and that got me very interested because most of the time when we talk about leadership development, we end up talking about training. We talk about classrooms. We talk about curriculum. We talk about instructors. We talk about promote the rotation programs and individual development plans. We don't talk about experiences that people have. And I started there because I began to realize that people have powerful experiences that never get raised at work. It's almost like you're leaving all this money on the table. Because, well, it's, it's, it's not about work, and therefore we can't talk about it. But the reality is if that's where people learn important things, then they learn not just the lesson about leadership, they learn about how they learn. Which is one of the reasons why throughout this, the five C's, we're constantly saying to people, you know, we can do psychometric assessments, we can put you through an assessment center, we can do training programs, those are all very valuable things. But every one of us carries around knowledge of ourselves that will make the difference between learning and not learning, between practicing and not practicing. And that's one of the reasons why I always ask people, you know, tell me about something that you've learned to be really good at that has nothing to do with work. And people will tell you stories about learning extraordinary things. And you say, oh, well then you're already able to learn. You already know what incentives you need to have, what tools and methods you need to have. What we need to do is to take what you know and apply it at work. So, Go ahead, why don't you join me? So Neil is my colleague and, and co-conspirator when it comes to these ideas. <laughs> Just one thought on the 5C model. Uh, when we are working with one of the clients in Indonesia, the structure that we adopted was we first went to commitment. To say that we need to build that ownership, accountability for learning in the participants. So we first went to commitment. Then we moved on to combination, which is to say that What's my inside purpose with the outside purpose? Once they were ready, then we started coaching. To say that my personal purpose is this, my organizational purpose is this, how do I align with some mentoring and coaching? And while this was going on, that's when we introduced the crucibles, which is we put them into some situation that they were never before. But they had the support of coaching, they knew why they were doing it because of their combination and they also understood that I have to do it because this is my commitment. Okay? Then now what we are doing is, as they are going through this journey, we are creating that community. That community has two dimensions. One is at an organizational level, the process are all getting redesigned to support them to work as one unit. Second thing is, they have decided to lean on to each other. Bob said, right? Nobody learns alone. They have decided to lean on to each other, looking at the similarity of purpose, and to learn from each other. So that's the community which is coming. So if you want a priority, you know, one example that we are doing here in Indonesia, for a state-owned enterprise, we are allowed to use. We seem to have some good success. Yeah, thank good, you very much. Good example, good example. Any other questions? Can you 
learn the way our brain works, the way it is wired, is that we learn by doing. Okay? It's by learning by doing. Bob talked about one concept which is practice while you're performing. Right? So the, the biggest gap in leadership development programs that we have seen is whatever you might do in the classroom or through some outbound training programs, when you come and try to apply it on the job, there is some gap. There is a wide gap or there is some gap. <clears throat> the only way to bridge that gap is to actually take something from your job and then make you do that. Which is to say that if you are an HR person, if you are a training person, how will you actually approach budgeting, capital budgeting? If you are a strategy person or if you are a marketing person, how will you approach operations and production? If I give you a problem of that. How will you solve that? And these are organization critical projects that deliver impact in a matter of three to six months. So that the organization then gets a feedback, are these people getting ready? Can I really invest in them and consider them as leaders? So there are multiple things that are happening. One is that I need to get into a space which I'm not comfortable. Two, I need to work with a different group of people to deliver. Three, the organization is getting a benefit and assessing me if I'm ready to get into the next level. So for example, in this client, the nature of the projects is that they have to develop one business case for the merger of three, four companies that will be put up in front of the parliament in the next four months after the elections. So it is that critical a project that these guys have to do in four months. One of the other projects that they have to do is this company has acquired another smaller company. It is making loss. The challenge is to make, turn it around in one year and make it self-sustainable by 10% in one year. Completely different set of operations. How do you do that? And the most important thing about Crucible is they have to do this while they are doing their current job. Which means they have to learn to give up certain things. Delegation. So they have to plan, they have to structure their lives. They have to create a network of people who will do their job so that they can focus on this. It's a very interesting dynamic. The more you get into it, I think, yeah. that's why Bob wrote a full book on it. I think we can discuss more and more about this as we... Yeah. I also, uh, interesting in the Toshiba experience, in my opinion, Toshiba experience is very uh, expensive because uh, um, uh, although this is the best uh, feature in the experience, the best feature means the uh, worst experience. No. Yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily. What is that? What the, because, of, for instance, from the I, Malaysian I am missing, we can learn the experience. In my opinion, this is um, the worst experience. Perhaps we can get the new leaders in Ireland's uh, civil safety. What would you like to share to me uh, the crucible uh, experience of crucible leaders with the small money or the cheaper than? Well, the, the starting point for me always is people's own experience, and the, their experiences are often. Yes, they learned a lesson it was expensive, but often not expensive in money. Expensive in ego, uh, ex expensive in pride, uh, and, and you know, for many of us, that's a lot more important than money. Uh, so when we talk about the experiences, there, there are three types that, that we identify. One experience that, that's a crucible experience um, is not about failure at all. Um, it's about surviving in new territory. For example, I recall uh, one, uh, one leader t telling a story, and 
and he had become a remarkable turnaround artist. So basically, he, he, he worked with companies that were failing, and he helped bring them back. And so I asked him to tell me at a time, about a time in his life, he learned something important about himself as a leader. And the story he told me was a story about when he was in high school. Uh, he had uh, wanted to join a club. And it was an accepted club on, on, in the high school campus. But they had an initiation that he had to go through in order to be able to join. And the initiation was that you were taken out into the forest in the middle of a very dark night uh, and left by yourself. And you had to find your way back to the camp by 9 a.m. the following morning. So even if you fell asleep and woke up at 6 a.m., there was going to be still plenty of light for you to find your way back find your way back. Well, he was there at midnight, sitting all by himself in the utter dark, literally could not see his hand in front of his face. And he started thinking, what if they put me on the edge of a cliff? Or well, what if I'm in a cave? Or well, what if I can't find my way back? And he started getting very upset. And he started crying. And before he knew it, and he's telling the story to me, he was in utter panic. He just was like a baby, inconsolable. There was nothing he could do to make himself feel better. He said he didn't know how long he cried. He didn't know how long he was in that panic. He said, but eventually he calmed himself down. So the one thing we want children to be able to do is to calm themselves. He felt terrible about the fact that he had panicked. And in the midst of his panic, what he kept thinking was, that night he's going to be on the news. They'll have a helicopter overhead rescuing this 16-year-old. He was going to die of embarrassment. So he was either going to die because he got lost, or he was going to die of embarrassment. Either way, he was dead, as far as he was concerned. But he pulled himself out of that panic. And the next morning, when the sun was up, it was very clear how he had to get back to the camp. But that night, he learned two very important things. One, he's capable of panic, which is not something that he's very proud of, but it was important to know. The second thing is he was capable of pulling himself out of panic, which was equally important for him to know. And so I said, so what difference does that make in your life? He said, well, look at the business I did. I'm in a business where people are panicking all the time. And it's my responsibility to help them deal with that panic. He said, I don't think I could if I hadn't known I was capable of the same thing. So the reason I tell you that story is it, it cost him nothing. But he learned an extraordinary amount. That's something we refer to as being in new territory, a place you've never been before and you discover how to survive. A second type is reversal, which includes failure. But some of the most powerful stories that people told us were stories in which they succeeded and they didn't know why. A fellow who was the CEO of a pharmaceutical company told me about the first team that he led in drug development, which came up with a, what in the industry is referred to as a blockbuster drug. I mean, an extraordinary drug that went on to generate billions of dollars of profit for the company. And because he was the leader of that team, they quickly elevated him up in the organization. He was never able to repeat that success. And that became, for him, his biggest obstacle. But when he realized it was, well, maybe he wasn't responsible for that success. Maybe they just happened on to that compound. But what he learned was that even success can be expensive. Even success can teach you something very important about being a leader, particularly when you can't repeat it. That's a form of failure, but it's not a failure that costs millions of dollars. And then the last example, the last type we, we talked about is what I refer to as, as um, suspension, which is probably not the most elegant word, but it's finding yourself in a situation where there is nothing familiar. So 
This young man who was in the dark by himself ultimately found familiar things and pulled himself out of it. Uh, but imagine being unemployed for five or six years. Uh, imagine having a near-death experience in which you're not sure you're ever going to come back. Imagine uh, being in a situation where you're thrown into jail for political reasons. Uh, and you have no idea whether you're going to ever be released. That's a huge challenge to you because suddenly everything you know has been taken away. And you need to somehow create a new set of handholds. Otherwise, you're going to just be falling in space. So each one of those kinds of experiences have the capacity to teach important things. But it's not the magnitude of the experience that matters. It's not the amount of money at risk. Um, it's what it means to you. Right, so this, this fellow who found himself lost in the woods, well, there was nobody else involved. There was no one else to experience it except him. The young woman who talked about her karate instructor saying, you've learned everything you're going to learn as a student. You must now be a teacher. Suddenly finding herself as a, a Chinese-American young woman uh, brought up with a belief that she should respect her elders and pay attention to their words and to their wishes. Suddenly being told to tell people who are twice her age what to do and what they're doing wrong. And that change for her was one where she suddenly discovered, this is a different world that I've moved into. So you and I may look at it and say, it's a small change. But for her, huge. So in a way, what Sunil has been saying when we talk about the kinds of experiences that people have, sometimes there's a lot of money involved. At Unilever, we're talking about growing a billion dollar business in two years. That's a lot of money to be at stake. But what's also interesting is that those guys are not going to fail. They will pull each other up and make sure that they are successful. So in that respect, I don't think that the crucible necessarily has to be expensive, um, but you do have to put something at risk. And chances are it's going to be your ego. Well, thank you. This has been a remarkably useful time. I've learned a lot. Thank you for that. And I look forward to hearing terrific things from this class. The next generation of leaders. For